was 1952, and Dwight Eisenhower was planning on running for president, and he was looking for a vice president. And he had the list of names narrowed down to really two people. One of them was a man named Earl Warren, a governor, I believe, of California at the time. And the other one was a young senator named Richard Nixon. And uh, Nixon was the front runner, one that was favored by many to be Eisenhower's running mate. And all of a sudden, uh, some of the Earl Warren supporters dropped this story, uh, leaked this story that Nixon was using a slush fund to pay for some of the campaign expenses. Now, it was nothing illegal. There was nothing wrong with it, but it was the first time that anyone had really thought about this. And Nixon said, well, there's so much money I get for being a senator, but I'm not allowed to use that for campaigns. And so people have contributed to this other fund, but it got blown way out of proportion where people were saying that Nixon should not be the vice presidential pick. And even Eisenhower was really on the fence about what he should do. And so Nixon and his team made this decision to rent the El Capitan Theater in Los Angeles and buy airspace, uh, uh, airtime on the TV. Uh, they paid $75,000, which is an equivalent to uh, $860,000 today to buy about an hour or so of uh, airtime. And he made a public address sitting at this desk to talk about the allegations and this slush fund. Now, in the end, what Nixon did, and this is what this speech is famous for, in the end, he admitted that he had gotten a gift from somebody. He said there was this donor in Texas that when he found out that my kids wanted a dog, sent us a little cocker spaniel, what, which they named Checkers. And he said this at the end of the speech, I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep it. And this made Nixon very popular right after all those people that had said that he should not be the vice president pick now said, oh, he definitely should be. And popularity went way up. And in fact, many people think that's maybe even this speech was what made uh, Eisenhower so popular to win the vote and become the president. But many people then and since have really seen that as a manipulation. He was really kind of dodging the question about what this fund was. And again, there was nothing wrong with it, but even just the, the manipulation of saying what you think I should give this dog back, you know, what kind of person would make, make someone, uh, someone's kids give their dog back? And that was kind of the question. But it made a lot of people say, boy, there's something about Nixon. I, I don't like him. I can't put my finger on it. And it was this manipulation. Now we're used to emotional manipulation in political circles, aren't we? And I, I try not to get political, but let me just talk frankly about some of the things that we face, right? Whenever there is gun violence, there's always the appeal, well, what about the children? Isn't it worth getting rid of every single gun if not one more child will die? That's an emotional appeal. Or uh, when they want to press a, an LGBT um, the gay agenda uh, in schools, they say, well, you're not for bullying, are you? I mean, ki these kids are being bullied, and so we have to put in legislation where you can't say anything about this, uh, otherwise you are for bullying. That's emotional manipulation. Or global warming, right? When they talk about global warming, what's the thing they talk about? The polar bears. Who wants to kill polar bears? They're cute, and they drink Coke, and nobody wants to kill them, and so... Maybe stop raising cattle and driving your car. Uh, otherwise, the polar bears might die. It's, it's an emotional appeal. And we all understand that sometimes there's a time for an emotional appeal. But sometimes, many times, it is just manipulation. Uh, I don't have this in my notes, so this is just free. But I've seen this with parents a lot, right? Instead of just saying, no, you're not going to do that, they say, oh, you're making mommy very sad. Well, why should you as a mom care if the kids are making you sad? Like, you don't get sad that your kids are disobeying you. It's just black or white. You do this or you don't do this. You know, you get disciplined or you don't get disciplined. It's up to you. It doesn't have to be an emotional thing. You don't have to bring emotions into it at all. But that's what we see, again, in our politics, in our life, this easy emotional manipulation. Even in the pro-life, pro-choice debates, very often, I, I, I don't know if you know this, but recently I reached out to um, some 
uh, left-leaning people in the area to ask them if they would like to represent the, the pro-abortion, pro-death, uh, pro-choice camp. Um, and they said, well, no, we, we're not interested in putting forth those things. Well, now, here's the thing. The truth is that there are no good pro-abortion arguments. But when you hear a pro-abortion ar argument, what is it? It's emotional. It's what about these poor, poor women? And I'll just say, again, there is a time for an emotional appeal, but very often it can be just manipulative. And we as Christians need to stand apart on truth. Not to say that we don't get emotional, not to say that we shouldn't take other things into consideration. It's one thing for our church to have a policy on benevolence, and sometimes even with that policy being there, we should still help and do the right thing. I understand all of that. But it caters to a part of us that we feel when we feel like we're threatened. It, it, very often what politicians are trying to do is trying to make us feel like a victim, right? And, and even current presidents, you know, uh, Joe Biden stands up and says, this is the end of democracy and makes people scared that all of a sudden we're gonna lose our republic. Or Trump says, you know, if they do this to me, they can do this to you. And, and all those things you might agree with, but it's still making us feel like victims. And I just want to warn us against this idea of feeling like we are victims. Because if you feel like you're a victim, um, at worst, you're going to do dangerous things. You're going to do things that are desperate because you feel like your very life and livelihood is in danger. At the best, you're going to feel very helpless about the whole thing. And how many of you have ever felt either like we got to do something about this or feeling just helpless, what, what's the use? We're going to lose it all anyway. That's not where I want to live. I don't think that's where any of us want to live. And even Christians, we are tempted to think sometimes, okay, it's just time to give up. It's all gone. It's all done. I'm just going to wait till Jesus comes, and I'm not going to do anything until he comes back. And listen, I'm looking forward to the, the appearing of Jesus Christ. I just read about this in my devotions this morning out of 1 Timothy. When Christ comes back, all the problems are gone. But let's not sit and stew in our problems and have this victim mentality to say, oh, the world's against me. Is the world against us? Sure. But is it okay to arm ourselves with that mindset, that mindset above everything else? Because aren't there also verses that talk about victory that we have in Christ, yeah. right? So here's what I'm, I'm, I'm saying, that our society is making it easy to adopt a victim mentality. I'll talk about this in a little bit. But I want to frame this in terms of 1 Samuel chapter 22. Um, now, I, I read this sort of uh, a few weeks ago when we talked about deception, because you remember that David went into Nob, a priest of the uh, a city of the priests, and he talked to a man named Ahimelech, who was a priest. Maybe the high priest, of the Bible's not real, real sh clear about what was going on with that, but he was, he was at least a, a, an important priest, just two miles away from Jerusalem, two miles away from Gibeah in the city called Nob. And David goes in and doesn't tell Ahimelech that he's on the run from Saul. He goes in and says, do you have any food? And Ahimelech says, well, yeah, I've got some food. I'll, I have some showbread. I'll give it to you. There's nothing wrong with that. David says, do you have a sword? He says, yeah, I've got this sword. It's actually the sword of Goliath. I'll give it to you. David took it and then went off. And we were, you remember maybe when we talked about this, that there was a man named Doeg there. Doeg was an Edomite. He was a servant of Saul. He, he was there detained before the Lord, the Bible says. And it doesn't give any details, but that. I'll bring that in a little bit later. But there was this, so here's the scenario. David on the run doesn't tell Ahimelech why he's there, really. He's running for his life from Saul. He's offended the king. He hasn't, but the king is offended because of him. He doesn't tell Ahimelech this. He gets supplies. He gets help from Ahimelech, which makes it look like Ahimelech is helping him knowing everything, but he, of course he doesn't know everything. Doeg sees this, and then we're going to see that Doeg goes to tell Saul about what Ahimelech did when Ahimelech didn't really do anything. And so uh, Saul brings him in. He accuses him. And when Ahimelech tries to defend himself, Saul is too far gone and tries, uh, and then tells Doeg to execute him. And Doeg kills not only Ahimelech, not only the priests, not only the priestly families, but destroys the entire city of Nob. We said back then that David was somewhat responsible for this. And I pointed out in verse 22 of chapter 22, David said unto Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there, that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. 
Now, I'm just kind of referring to the story. I'd, I'd like to read it, and I think we have time for that, and so, and it's my birthday, so I can do what I want. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> How long can I milk that, right, Lydia? <laughs> um, I, I want to read this passage now, giving you some context as we read through it. Hopefully, you'll understand it. And we're going to look then at three victimizers, Saul, Doeg, and David. And we're really going to just spend a little bit of time on David, most of our time on Saul and Doeg. And we're going to talk about these victimizers, and the only true victim here is Ahimelech. Even David isn't really a victim in this. But I want to look at this and then talk about offenses when we offend somebody else or when we victimize somebody else. What's the proper response? What leads to that, and what's the proper response? Now, again, I do not take some social thing of the day and say, how can I press that into the Bible? Some pastors do that, and they'll have to answer to God before that. This is just the next passage that we're looking at. And as we look at this, we ask the question, how do I apply this to my life? I mean, normally you wouldn't do this with any other book, right? Uh, Charlemagne goes into you know, Constantinople and you say, okay, how do I apply that to my life? You don't have to apply that to your life. It's just something that happened. But when we read the Bible, this is not just written as a historical record. It's also for our profiting. It's for our benefit. It's for our good. And so let's read this passage. And again, we're asking, God, would you bring this to life in my own life? So let's look at verse number six of chapter 22 of 1 Samuel. When Saul heard that David was discovered that the men that were with him now saw abode in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. Then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, Hear now, ye Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards, and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me? And there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse, and there is none of you that is sorry for me or showeth unto me that my son hath stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as it is this day. Is that this day? Then answered Doeg the Edomite, which was said over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, and he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him victuals, food, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Then the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub and all his father's house, the priests that were in Nob, and they came all of them to the king. And Saul said, Here now, thou son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. He doesn't know what's going on, right? And Saul said unto him, Why have you conspired against me, that thou and the son of Jesse, in that thou hast given him bread and a sword, and hast inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as at this day? Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, Ah, uh, and who is so faithful among all thy servants is David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thine house. D did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father, for thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. And the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. And the king said unto the footmen that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. They knew better. And the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priests and slew on that day fourscore and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. And Nob, the city of the priests, smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings, and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar showed David that Saul had slain the Lord, Lord's priests. And David said unto Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. Abide thou with me, fear not, for he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life, but with me thou shalt be in safeguard. Let's first of all look at Saul. So Saul's looking for David, and he hears that he's found, he's, he's been discovered. And so he gathers his men basically to rant. He's unhappy. Now, I did a lot of thinking about Saul's reaction here, and it's an interesting, I was talking to Caleb about this on Wednesday night, it's an interesting study about how Saul is thinking. 
because he is, he posits that they're conspiring against him, that David has somehow secretly bribed him. Now, again, he's paranoid, right? He, he has no basis for this, but he's thinking, David is for sure out to kill me and take my throne. Not true. And, and I know this, but none of the servants have told me about this. Maybe the servants haven't told you because it's not true. But he says, what, what could I, how can I connect these dots? David's after me. I know that. How would I know that and my servants not know it? It must be that they've been bribed. David must have gotten to them first. Well, I'm going to tell them that I know what's going on. You're not going to pull one over on old Saul. I know what's going on. David's trying to kill me, and he's using you guys to do it. And they're all kind of like, what are you talking about? Saul, so, yeah, I wish there was somebody with a harp who could probably play for this guy and get him to calm down a little bit. Saul posits that they're conspiring against him, that David bribed them. He says in verse 8 that they don't feel sorry for him. Saul charges that they're hiding information from him. You, you haven't even told me that my own son is conspiring against me. He's certain that he's the victim, and he feels justified in what he's about to do. He feels like, why aren't you guys feeling sorry for me? I'm the victim here. I'm on the throne, and there's this guy named David who's out trying to kill me. Come on, guys. This is so obvious. I'm the victim. Well, he's not the victim. But that's a mentality that we can get if we're not careful. Victim mentality is when someone feels that bad things happen to them no matter what. I read an article this week from the Gospel Coalition, uh, a guy named Akos Belog. He was a Hungarian refugee. His family and people had been killed and systematically destroyed, and he grew up with this mentality that we are victims and wore it around like a cloak and as a Christian then became to find out how dangerous this mindset is. He says this, victimization is thus a combination of seeing most things in life as negative beyond your control and as something you should be given sympathy for experiencing as you deserve better. He's saying this, this is the mentality that you're always, it's always this cloud over you that people are out to get you. One uh, author named Scott Barry Kaufman says, this is how you would know a person with a victim mentality. He says, quote, it's based on clinical, based on clinical observations and research. The researchers found that the tendency for interpersonal victimhood consists of four main dimensions. A, constantly seeking recognition for one's victimhood. B, moral elitism. C, lack of empathy for the pain and suffering of others. And D, frequently ruminating about past victimization. Now that's Saul, isn't it? Now those four things, that's, that's Saul. That's a lot of other people we find out in Scripture too, but that fits Saul. He has this victim mentality that there's someone out. It's not just a conspiracy theory. To them it's real, but it's not just about conspiracy. It's about Everything is viewed through the lens of I, life has not been fair to me. I deserve better. People are out to get me. No one is for me. And it's just this spiral that goes down. Now, the danger of such a victim mentality, and maybe you have it, and so I'm warning you, is this. First of all, you possess an untrue worldview. You put on a pair of glasses that show the world not as it really is. And we all know how dangerous that can be, how dangerous it is to not see things for what they are. I know that every single person has blind spots. We all have things that we don't see. Hopefully you as a Christian are just walking with the Lord enough. And, and I know this from personal experience that the Lord will show you those things. You're not thinking about this right. You're not thinking about this in a way that's actually describing reality, truth. We as Christians ought to be people of truth. And anything that would make it so that we're seeing things off and seeing things in a negative light is not what God wants us to do. Now, I'm not saying that we need to be Pollyanna, right? Everything's fine all the time. Paul admits sometimes, like, things aren't great. But he has the perspective of, but God is in this to make it good for me. And so as we look at the, the right perspective, we also have to understand that there's the wrong perspective. Do you assume the worst about others? You know, you don't give anybody the benefit of the doubt. Anything that anybody says, it's always, it always has to reflect back on me, and it's always negative. Maybe you are a bit of a conspiracy theorist. You're looking at everything through, well, they're out to get us. That's a very dangerous place to be. I've met too many people like that. And I'll tell you, they're not doing anything for God's glory. 
They're not doing anything for the kingdom at all because it's all about them and this physical kingdom. Satan would love for you to focus on this physical kingdom, the next election. And listen, I have very definite thoughts about the next election. I have, and I'll talk about this in probably three weeks about how important the election is and everything like that. But right now I'm just saying, Sometimes we can just focus way too much on that and believe all of the stuff that's been said about the, who's at the levers. Listen, I'm not, I'm not saying that there aren't things going on. I'm just saying, is that the best and healthiest mindset to look at? That we're always at the bottom of this, of this pool of slush of the, what's going on in the world, that we're always the victim. Is that where God wants us? I don't think that's where God wants us at all. Um, one of the ways that we've seen this really explode is in something called identity politics. And it's the idea that everything is looked at through a, a oppressor and oppressive matrix. Um, that, that there are two kinds of people in the world. And whenever someone says there are two kinds of people in the world, just like, okay, you're making things very simple, right? We, you know, the Jewish people thought there's Jews and Gentiles, and then Christ says, but I'm bringing both of those into one, right? There's people that are right, and there's people that are wrong, and I'm always on the right side. But there's there, the people that, in, that are involved in this identity politics see the whole world as victim um, and oppressed and victimizer and oppressor, and that's everything. And that, honestly, that's why so many people inexplicably are protesting for Palestine. And for Hamas, I have no comprehension why they would, except that I understand that they're coming at things from an identity politics mindset and matrix, where they say Israel is the oppressor, and Hamas, the Palestinians, are the oppressed, and so we always stick up for the victim. Now again, that's a very simplistic view of Middle Eastern politics. It's a very simplistic view of Israel. I've been to Israel, and I have a perspective on what's really going on there. But when you have this matrix of there's only victims and victimizers, there's only oppressed and oppressors, then you're going to make, you're going to end up siding with a lot of really wicked people. And that's what we're seeing in this, in the world. We're seeing, uh, again, we, we, when you look at uh, this idea in identity politics of there's only the oppressed and the oppressor, then you have to start identifying who the oppressors are right? It's men over women. It's whites over minorities. And, and then, then, of course, when you go to define minorities, that gets harder too, doesn't it? Because there are some minorities who are, are really white, even though they're not. I don't know how all that works, but there's this whole, right? There's this whole matrix that you're looking at the world through. And what have we seen when people adopt that mindset, when they feel like they're victims? Like I said, they feel desperate enough to do something really dangerous, to do something really desperate. So that's one of the first problems. It possesses an untrue worldview. Second, one of the dangers of a victim mentality is that it tells people that they're stuck, that there's no way out. It's called learned helplessness, that the system is against you and there's nothing you can do to break out of this. Um, and again, here's another buzzword, but if you understand it, it makes a lot more sense about what's going on in the world. The word is intersectionality. And the idea is basically, um, if you are a part of one victim class, then that means you're oppressed a little. But if maybe you're a part of a couple different ones, then all of a sudden that just means that you're more oppressed. And, and the more of these that you have, the more it feels like you can get away with. Like there was this there was this uh, video a little while ago of this lady that got pulled over for speeding, okay? So the only thing the officer is, cares about is, were you breaking the law? The posted speed limit, were you breaking that? And she starts breaking at all these things. Well, I'm, I'm a lesbian, and well, I'm, I'm a minority, and well, I'm all in. And the cop is like, I don't care. You were breaking the law. <laughs> but hoping like, well, I'm, I'm a victim in all these areas, and so don't victimize me even further in this area. And when you have that mentality, you feel like I'm just stuck. I'm never going to get out of this. But can I say that it's wrong to tell people that they can never break out of whatever mold they're in? Is it wrong to tell a person that, hey, you're a victim and that's all you'll ever be is a victim? Would that be all right if we, told, if we went to the, to the police station and found someone who had been uh, brutally assaulted and said, well, you're just a victim. That's all you're ever going to be. You're, all you're ever going to be in your whole life is a punching bag. Well, no, of course that would be wrong. Well, why do we do that with other people then? Why do we tell people like, this is just the way it is? Why do we tell each other, well, just the Christian life, this is all there is. We're just going to be beat up until Jesus comes. It doesn't make any sense to do that. Let's not feel like we're stuck. 
That's not even true. Again, what did, what did Paul say? Paul says, in Christ, we're more than conquerors. We don't need to adopt this mindset. The helpless people, have you noticed, get desperate, and they're willing to resort to violence. Why is it that we're seeing the fabric of our society uh, come apart? Because people have this matrix of the victim, and, and as a victim, they feel like there's no way out but violence. There are some times that violence is called for. I don't think we're at that point yet. And as, as long as we think that we're the victims, then we're going to do whatever, and we should do whatever it takes to not be a victim. And the, the Civil War was about a whole population of people who were victims who could not free themselves, or for whatever reason, did not. And it was important for other people to stand up for actual victims. Um, but even in that, there are people who still feel like they're victims. It also then, third, removes accountability and responsibility. Again, if you're a victim, if you're a leaf blowing in the wind, then what follows can't be attributed to, to you either. You're, you're justified in whatever you do if you're a victim. And I think that's why people adopt a victim mentality. Well, poor me, this happened, so whatever I do, I can justify anything. And there's no accountability, there's no responsibility, and then you're just in this spiral again. This is where Saul is. He feels like he is totally helpless. Uh, David is surely going to kill him and take his throne, and his servants aren't telling him about it, and his son is turned about, turned against him, and he is so desperate that something needs to happen, and the solution he comes up with this in this chapter is to kill an entire city of priests. This is, this is the end of a victim mentality. The temptation to bitterness and a refusal to forgive, that's another danger of a victim mentality, and then it may also, again, lead to victimizing others. So what are some ways you find yourself in a victim mentality? Can I warn you against that? Wherever you feel like, this is my life, this is the way it is, other people have done this to me, can I encourage you to forgive and to not let bitterness take a hold of you? Can I encourage you to not look at the world in a very binary, black and white way, but through Christ to be able to give you the right perspective? I'm not making justification for evil things. I'm saying for you, for you. Are there areas in your life you have taken on this victim mentality. I'm not saying that you haven't been victimized, all right? You maybe have legitimate reasons to say, I have actually been victimized, and you are worth um, praying for and helping. But have you adopted, my question, a victim mentality? Would you ask God to deliver you from that? That's the first victimizer. That's Saul. The second is Doeg. Doeg was told to kill the priests, in verse 18, and doesn't even hesitate. The servants of Saul, they say, wait a minute, what? I mean, it's one thing to bring the priests here and to question them, but you want us to kill them? These are the priests of God. And the Bible says, touch not mine anointed, and that's talking specifically about a priest. What, I'm not going to do that. And they just, they just, they don't even pull their swords out. And he turns to Doeg and says, Doeg, would you do this? Now, we're unsure of his motivation. Um, earlier in the, earlier back in chapter 21, it says that he was detained before the Lord. Detained implies, remember we said this at the time, that he wasn't allowed to leave. So maybe he was, uh, he'd done something wrong. He was unclean. He wanted to leave, but he was detained there before the Lord. Maybe there was something about that where he had bitterness against being detained before the Lord. We also note that he was an Edomite, a sworn enemy of Israel. Why Saul had an Edomite in his administration, we don't know. But he goes further than even the command because what Saul says is, um, fall on them and kill the priests, right? He says in um, verse number 18, turn thou and fall upon the priests. But Doeg goes even further, goes the two miles and probably had some people with him, maybe some herdsmen with him and goes, and if you notice in verse number 19, kills men, who weren't priests, women, children, babies, ox, donkeys, sheep, everything just decimates the entire city. Now, again, that speaks to me of animosity, of great hatred, that there was something there. Now, some people will victimize others, not because they feel like they're a victim mentality, they're a caged animal that just strikes out. You almost, almost understand that. Some people victimize other people, get this, just because they're wicked just because they're evil, right? The question we always ask is, why? What would make someone do this? And the assumption is, I wouldn't. 
right? There's a lot of people, again, going back to the, the Hamas and Israel, there's a lot of people that were saying, well, why? We, sh we shouldn't just assume that Hamas is putting their, uh, their you know, arms and, and their terrorists among civilian populations because I wouldn't do that. No, you maybe wouldn't, but they're not like you. They have a different mentality than you do. Understand? So like, can we just, we return, and, and, and this is really something that bothers me in, in Hollywood is now trying to try to um, contextualize villains. You know, you have some villain and some famous villain, even in like a Disney movie, and it's like, let's make a movie about this evil person to give them the background, to make them a little more likable. And it's this distortion of truth to be able to say, well, you know, everyone has a reason for what they do. Can't we just say that some people are really wicked and some people just want the wrong thing? Some people just love evil. Hamas, they're not victims. Hamas loves to kill Jewish people. That's why they do what they did. They're not being oppressed. They just, they just love to kill. I'm not saying every Palestinian loves to kill every Jew. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying Hamas is an organization that one of their stated goals is to kill every Jewish person, children or otherwise. So let's not try to contextualize that. Listen, women who go to abortion clinics are trying to kill their baby. And I know that there are some women who don't have all the facts, but in a day and age where we can see on, on an ultrasound, you see the development of the baby, let's not say, well, there are reasons and there are things. Look, can't we just say this is a wicked thing that we should stand against? This is an awful thing that should not be in our country. Can't we just say that? When we look at what's going on with the border and, and the cartels coming across the border, um, can we understand that that, it, that wouldn't happen if Americans weren't buying drugs? Like for us to just say, well, you know, drugs, let's legalize it, let's, let's tax it, whatever. Can we just say that if it weren't for that, if every American decided we are not going to buy drugs anymore, especially then that, that whole border, like there would be no reason for people to be coming across the border except for jobs. <laughs> like they're not coming over just for because we should feel sorry for them. There are some who do, and there's a legal process for that. Listen, I, I, I don't want you to hear me getting political. I'm saying I'm contextualizing what we're seeing here, and this is what tears apart a nation. Because Saul, instead of defending his nation, instead of going after the real enemies, is going after David and his paranoia. And instead of killing the Philistines, is killing the priests. Right? This is how dangerous it is. And I'm just saying there is a mentality that, well, you have to see both sides. And I understand that. I get the gray that is often in the world. But I also just want to say that some people are just wicked. Can't we just call evil evil and not try to nuance everything? Go over to Psalm 52. And, and the reason we want you to go to Psalm 52, I'll show you what this, what this psalm is. And uh, Caleb already read it, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. But I will just point out to you the little title right after Psalm 52. Psalm 52, to the chief musician Maskell, a psalm of David, when? When Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul and said unto him, David is come to the house of Ahimelech. So David wrote this psalm when he heard about what Doeg had done, that Doeg went and lied to Saul about what was going on. Now Saul, Doeg didn't lie about Ahimelech giving him bread and a sword, but he did lie about inquiring of the Lord for him. That implied that he was giving divine help to David, and Ahimelech never did that. So he, he noticed this title, and then what he says about Ahimelech, or about Doeg, rather. There's no nuance here. Verse 2, thy tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor working deceitfully. He, he says, you're, you're using your words to hurt others. You lied about Ahimelech. And he didn't say, uh, King, I saw Ahimelech give bread and a sword to David, but David told him that he was on an errand from you. He admitted that part, right? He's using his tongue as a razor to cut at Ahimelech. And again, we don't have to know why because, the, because Psalm 52 doesn't tell us why he did it. It just says, you just love to use your tongue to cut other people down. You just love to make victims just because you love wickedness. Look at verse three. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Thou lovest all devouring words, thou deceitful tongue. Did you hear any nuance there? Any gray? 
No, he's just saying you love lying even more than you love the truth. You love evil even more than you love righteousness and the good. And can we not just admit that there are people in the world who just love sin? right? I, I understand that there are people who are victims of Satan. Satan has blinded their minds. He's, he's, he's uh, lied to them. Uh, we understand that in some ways, victims, but also understand that we all sin because we want to. Yeah. Have you ever sinned because you didn't want to? No, I'm not saying you sin and then afterwards you regret it. I'm saying, has anyone ever been forced to sin? No, we sin because we want to, right? right? And can't we just say, like, sin is a wicked thing, and, and, and I'm a sinner, and I deserve what everybody deserves, hell, forever. Now, I'm glad that God, in knowing that we are in some ways, again, putting this out there, a victim of Satan, or at least being lied to by Satan, has brought the truth through Jesus Christ and has made a way not only to show his love for us, but also to provide forgiveness. And the way he did it is this, that God sent Jesus Christ to do for you what, he, what you could not do. You can't live a perfect life. That means you can't get to heaven. The wages of sin is death, not just physical death, but spiritual death, the second death, eternity in the lake of fire. That's what every single one of us deserve for little sins, big sins, and everything in between. It doesn't matter. We've all sinned against God. We all deserve hell forever. And yet God, understanding that, sent Jesus Christ to do for you what you could not do. He lived a perfect life. He earned the righteousness of God, and he earned heaven. The only person who deserves to go to heaven is Jesus Christ. And Jesus offers you something wonderful. He says, I will give you my righteousness and I will take your sins. The Bible says, he, may, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Second Chronicles, or uh, Second Corinthians 5.21, that there is an exchange that can happen. And if you're sitting here this morning, you say, Pastor, I don't, you asked that question earlier about if you were to die today, do you know whether or not you go to heaven? Listen, you can have that question answered. I, I know that I'm on my way to heaven. Not because I'm a good person, not because I'm a Baptist pastor. Lots of Baptist pastors are not going to heaven, okay? It, it doesn't guarantee me anything. I know that I'm on my way to heaven because when I was a five-year-old boy, I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I admitted that I was a sinner, and I accepted the only way to heaven, which is Jesus Christ on the cross for my sins. I accepted it for me. Forty years I've been walking with the Lord, and, and I know that I'm on my way to heaven not because of anything I've done, but because of the promise of God. So, so when I talk about sin, I'm not saying your sin. I know sin. I understand sin. And, and this is, again, Doeg, who is just an evil man, just someone who loves wickedness. Look at verse number five through seven. He says he'll be punished for his wickedness. And again, this is what we're talking about. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. The righteous also shall see and fear and laugh at him. Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. He says, God will kill you. He'll take you out of your place. Others will see you and mock you. Now, we don't know what happened to Doeg in the end. We have no uh, anything. Was he still alive when David became king? I'm guessing he didn't live very long after that if he did, but the Bible doesn't tell us. The Bible doesn't tell us if he died in war, if he got trampled by donkeys. That was kind of his domain. He was the keeper of the donkeys, and so maybe, maybe in just divine justice, something, something like that happened to him. I have no idea. Maybe, you know, people who live by the sword will die by the sword. Maybe Saul eventually had Doeg killed. We don't know what happened to him. But David pronounces this punishment against him. There's no nuance here. He's just an evil man. And David says, I don't want to be like him. Verse 8, but I'm like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it, and I will wait on thy name, for it is good before thy saints. We have the victim, the victimizers of Saul and Doeg, and we admitted already that David was one of these. He admits it. He says, I was a part of this as well. So let's finally go back to 1 Samuel 22 and for just a moment talk about David. How should we act when we've victimized others, when we've offended others? This is a fact. We're going to sin against other people. J uh, James 3 verse 2 says, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. That's not an excuse. It's just saying, admit that you know that you're a sinner and that you're going to sin. When it happens, what do we do? In chapter, uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus says it's impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him 
through whom they come. It's impossible that you'd never offend anybody, but what do you do when, they, when that happens? First of all, admit that you're wrong. Ad- admission just means confession. The word confess means to agree with, to say the same thing as. Yep, I did the wrong thing there. And that's what David does here. In verse 22, I knew it that day when Doeg was, the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of my father's house. It was my fault. I should have, I should have said, Elhimelech, listen, you need to know that I'm on the run from Saul and you could get into real trouble if you help me. Maybe Ahimelech would have said, thank you for letting me know. I really can't help you. And then he would have gone to tell Saul or something like that. David realized, I did the wrong thing. I lied. I deceived Ahimelech. And because of that, everyone's dead. He confessed it. And now that's a, that's a hard thing to do sometimes to come to that point where we agree because, again, we just love to nuance our own sins, don't we? Well, I'm sorry I did this, but... Well, I'm sorry I said that, but you... Right? It's hard. Just, can't you just say, I did the wrong thing. I had the wrong attitude. I had the, I had the wrong view of this. I said the wrong thing. I didn't, even think about, I didn't even think about what the right response might have been. I just picked the worst one, and I shouldn't have done that. That's part of confession is just saying, that was wrong. You're right. I, I was wrong, and I shouldn't have done that. You don't have to admit to anything but your part in the whole scheme, but admit your part. Second, take responsibility. David says, I have occasioned the death of all the persons. He didn't say, I'm sorry that Saul did that. Well, Doeg, he was the one that really did it. He was fully justified in that, to say, Saul's the one that gave the order. Doeg's the one that did it. Sure, I wasn't completely honest, but I didn't know that they were going to die. It's not my fault. What am I supposed to do? I have a crystal ball. I'm supposed to know the future? David says, you know what? If I hadn't lied, none of this would have happened. Saul wouldn't have done what he did. Doeg wouldn't have done what he did. It was my fault. He, he takes responsibility. A victim mentality looks for someone else to blame. But we as Christians are people that ought to say, yeah, it's, it's, it's me. I'm the one that can do something about it. I'm the one that has any kind of control over my response. Oh, my parents taught me this. And, you know, understand the way I am because of my parents. Yep. Yeah. We have all had parents that didn't do perfect, and I'm a parent who didn't do perfect, right? But uh, your life is yours to change. I- I'm so glad for the grace of God to overcome some of the challenges that some of my brothers and sisters face because of what their parents did or who they were. Isn't it a great thing to know that the grace of God can overcome that? You don't have to be a victim there. Well, my boss doesn't like me. Yeah, it, you know, it might make it harder. For you to live for Christ in an environment where it's not very friendly, but ask any first century Christian how easy it was for them to live for the Lord, right? You're not going to get out of this. First Peter, I'm preaching through that on the radio, um, and, and he just over and over again says, yeah, you're going to live in a world, but shine as lights. You're a, you're a chosen priesthood, a holy nation. So live like a peculiar person. <laughs> live like someone who's been set apart. My spouse isn't holding up their end of the deal. You know, I would respect him if he loved me, or I would love her if she respected me. You know what? God just calls you to do your part, to take your responsibility for what you are called to do. You say, okay, so if I, you say, if I do my part, they'll do their part. You know what? I found that to be true in so many cases, but not everyone. Why don't you just do it? Because it's the right thing to do. Take responsibility for it. And then finally, make restitution. David took... Um, Um, Abiathar to live with him. And it says in verse 23, Abide thou with me, fear not, for he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life, but with me thou shalt be in safeguard. He said, I couldn't protect your father. I should have. I couldn't protect your family and your city, whoever else you lost. I should have. I should have done what it took, and I I messed up, but um, I will protect you, Abiathar. I'll be your safeguard. He, He, if you can restore, restore. If you can ask for forgiveness, you can at least take away the sting of what you've done a little bit. This is the thing I love about David and what I wanted to preach in his life. He's not perfect, but he admits when he was wrong and he wants to make things right. He's a man after God's own heart, not because he never sinned, but because in his sinning, when he victimized, he took the victim and said, I I did the wrong thing. I want to make it right to you. Doeg, Saul, let them do what they're going to do. But you as Christian, first of all, don't take the victim mentality. Don't be lied to. Second, I understand that people are just sometimes wicked. We need to pray for them. We need to do what we can. But understand there is a force there that can't be reckoned with here in this life. 
And third, when you're the victimizer, then learn to confess it and agree and ask for God's forgiveness and make restitution as best you can.